Hello, welcome to the next series of webinars that we do involving uh, the Paratech equipment. This webinar is actually entitled Structural Collapse Utilizing the SMT. Uh, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager with Paratech. And alongside me in the picture, as you see, is the instructor from Spec Rescue. That's Randy Jernigan Jr. We both be doing this, this PowerPoint together and you'll see us in the, also in the videos as we go through. I'd like to thank uh, IFSI, Illinois Fire Service Institute, for the loan of the uh, collapse site at the property there in Champaign. We uh, utilized their site to make the videos uh, in January. As you see, it was a little bit cold there. There was uh, snow on top of ice, so we were slipping around a little bit. But we managed to do the videos and bring them to you uh, today. Spec Rescue International is what we used for our universities. Uh, they got a cadre of instructors, uh, great bunch of guys. A lot of the instructors have been uh, trained by Paratech to use the Paratech equipment in their classes. Uh, they were formed in 1994. They, they offer cutting edge technology with uh, comprehensive training, consulting, and they also develop a lot of things for the emergency services. Uh, they do a lot of development with uh, Connex boxes and things like that, doing search search uh, rooms and all different things. Uh, but the Spec family on the bottom, if you see, they strongly feel for providing the customers with up-to-date information, equipment training, uh, utilize of all situations. They do a lot of training with the military. They do a lot of training with the municipal fire departments all around the, all around the world. If you want information on Spec Rescue, you can go to the two websites at the bottom. One of them is the Spec Rescue website, and the other one is the Facebook for Spec Rescue. Paratech. We at Paratech, we're a veteran-owned company. We, we're uh, a privately owned. We've been in business since 62. All the production and manufacturing is uh, done in Frankfurt, Illinois, which is in the suburbs of Chicago. So everything we make is, uh, is made in the USA. It's not made in other countries, and it's used worldwide. We proudly serve the fire and emergency services as well as the military that uses all our equipments when they're overseas, in this country, in, in different uh, hot zones, wherever they are. We've got a full ser service and sales support staff. That can be coordinated through your regional managers. Uh, we've got three girls in the office, uh, we've got John in the office, that do a great job in answering any questions you have, as well as the RSMs that are around the country or around the world that can answer your questions. If you want more resources for Paratech, Click on the link, paratech.com or paratech.com workshops if you want to see previous workshops that we've done over the last couple of years during this COVID uh, time. What I'd like to discuss on this slide is if you take a look at the bottom right, what that is, when this is playing through YouTube, you can ask questions on the chat section on the right or at the bottom of the screen. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's where we get our basis from, and that's where we can answer them at the end of the, the actual workshop. We, myself and Randy, will answer, will be answering questions, plus there will be a couple of RSMs online that will be answering as you type, because it's a little bit hard for us to answer your questions with typing while we are talking and doing the actual PowerPoint itself and the webinar. Again, this PowerPoint presentation is for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for hands-on training and taught by a qualified instructor. Regular hands-on training is necessary to become proficient in what you do. Improper use of any equipment may cause serious injury or death. Think safe, act safe, or be safe. Okay, if you take a look at the picture, urban search and rescue using the Paratech SMT. These are the special mission tenders that we, we put out there. This one is uh, it's a Gen 2, it's a 20 foot long by eight foot wide. 
And it's a USAR trailer. So you take a look at the contents that's in there. We have gold struts, gray struts, uh, all different kits, all different bases, and the bins to hold them. It's everything's just contained in the one trailer. It's it's made for when the tow vehicle drops it. It's got the generator on board. It's got the command light up on top for scene lighting. It's got scene lightings on each side. It's made to be hold itself on its own for electrical and every other every other piece of uh, work it needs to do. Also inside this particular trailer in the Gen 2, it comes with two iPads. What the iPads give you, it's we've downloaded uh, the Paratech manuals on there for different things. We've downloaded the field operation guide from uh, FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers are on there. And it's got plenty of space to download whatever your, your SOP is for whatever discipline you're going to do, what your department requires. All that can be downloaded on those iPads. So you can look at them, look at them pretty quick. It's all undercover, and you can go on from there and do what you need to do with the site and everything else you need to do with the scene. So this is the equipment that is in the SMT. This is basically part of the equipment. This is the USAR rescue strut system. As you see in there, it's got a complement of gold, complement of gray, and if you take a look, it's actually got two absolute raker sets at the bottom of that page. So this is just part of what comes in an SMT. This kit, you can do everything you need to do with structural collapse. It's got the bases. Also with this kit, you can actually move this over to trench rescue as well. It gives you a lot of the shores we use in trench rescue from the smaller to the larger to the 610s and all the extensions that need, that's needed in this. Again, going back to the gray, your Acme thread struts, they have a, they have a maximum load of up to 80,000 pounds, 36.4 metric tons, to four feet. Uh, it's a 20,000 pound with a four to one safety factor. What that means is up to four feet, 20,000 pound, that's with a four to one, one to one on that gray strut at four feet is 80,000 pounds. So that four to one, as you divide 80 by four, gives you the working load of 20,000 20, pounds on nine metric tons. Now we use extensions with these. If you take a look, we've got five different acne struts. We've got the four that's in line and a small one just above. That small one just above is a 12 to 15 inch acne thread strut. It has no pneumatic features whatsoever. It's just got a three inch adjustable thread on there. It's for low clearance. And that's all that, that strut is used for. You put a base on each end and offer it to the space that it needs to go into and tighten it up. Also that 12 to 15 cannot be used with the hydrofusions. I just bring that up because on the, the actual uh, Trailers themselves are some hydrofusions. If you want something small to put into a hydrofusion, then use a six inch extension with the extension converter or the strut converter that's there. So with the gray struts, the acne struts, they are basically designed for spanning shorter distances. If you take a look at the extensions, we've got four sizes of extension and you see the little uh, extension converter that's there. That's what you need to go into the extension and the extension into the hydrofusion. Maximum of two extensions, not to exceed three feet on the acne rescue struts. What I mean by that is I can use a 12 inch and a 24 inch. I can use a six and a 12, two sixes. I can use two 12s. I can't use any more than that to put onto the struts to exceed what the label says for the maximum allowable extensions on that strut for the length and the capacity. So we've got a rule of thumb with this. We've got a one, two, three rule on the Acme thread struts. One struts, two extensions, not to exceed three feet. Next thing we got in the equipment on the, the trailer are the longshore struts. Longshore struts you see there, 
We've got five different sizes, ranging from two feet up to 16 feet. Uh, we've got four sizes of extension, along with an extension converter that you see there. These were designed to span longer distances. The designed capacity on the long shore, the gold struts, is the same as the gray. Maximum workload of 20,000 pounds. That's for the four to one safety factor, and that's up to eight feet. Again, going back to the to the calculations, maximum to eight feet, one to one is 80,000 pounds. Divide your 80 by four gives you a 20,000 pound workload and a four to one safety factor. There are pneumatic fittings on all of the long shores. So every one of them will accept a hose. So you can actually use them in structural claps. You can actually use them in trench rescue and also the vehicle side. The rule of thumb with extensions on the, the long shores is the maximum of one extension per strut. And remember on both Acme thread struts and the long shore struts, the extension always goes on the solid end of the strut, never on the Acme thread moving end of the strut. Or if you take a look at the extension on the strut, the bottom of the extension has got the step down, the strut's got the step down, that's where the extension goes on. Also, it's got a yellow ring at the top of the extension, and you see there's a yellow ring on the step down of the actual longshore strut. That's where the extension goes. Just a little, little trick of the trade with extensions. Uh, some people do get it wrong, and the biggest problem is if you get it wrong, then all the load is relying on that little lock pin that sits into the hole on the, the threaded shaft of the strut. Okay, some of the equipment in the SMT we could take a look at. The SMT is capable of building these uh, raker systems. As you see, we've got on the left, we've got an absolute raker. It can build two of those. Then the middle, the middle picture is showing us an absolute flying raker. It can build a bunch of those. The reason is we can take that uh, 610 off the bottom of the absolute raker and just make more legs for the flying raker utilizing the other rails that's there. So example, if I use two of, the, two of the absolute raker systems, I can span maybe 24 foot of wall. If I convert them into flying rakers with the same equipment, I can span the region of maybe 60 to 80 foot of wall with the same equipment. Now the capacity for the, the rakers, the wooden rakers that you build in your classes are only good for 8,000 pound per system. On the Paratech rakers, depending on what raker it is, you take a look in the tabulated data, some of those rakers can go up to 70,000 pounds on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, if you take a look on the far right picture, we can also do an absolute double raker with the equipment that's in the SMT. All this you'll see in the videos, and how it goes together. Both some of the other equipment that's in the trailer, we do the pod systems. Bear with me one second. I'm having a problem with the, the actual PowerPoint, which is advancing, so I just gotta put it back to the picture. If you take a look at some of the pod systems we got, all the pod systems are in the trailer. We got the monopod. As you see there, we got the bipod and the tripod. Those systems can be used with the, the, the equipment that's in there with regarding the longshores. The two pod systems, the monopod and bipod, can only be used with longshores, whereas the tripod system that you see there, that can be used with both the Acme thread, the gray, and longshore, the gold. So the tripod's the only pod system that can be used with both Acme and longshore. So the other two systems you see there on the right-hand side, we've got the slope floor that we're going to go over later on in the webinar. and the high strength structural kit that's there that you see holding up those beams, uh, that's commonly known as a column base or a column shore. Consists of three long shores, 
on two bases along with the center brace that's in there for a longer span. Okay, coming into our Rescue Guardian feature. Uh, the trailer's got four of these on there. The Rescue Guardian is the new, uh, it, it's, it's, it's for sight and scene monitoring. Where the old system we had was just a, a load cell. It just did load. What, this, what the Rescue Guardian does, it's cool in the feature, features that you see there. It can be used. Uh, it's got adapters that, that's magnetic, as you see on the left. Then it, it can use a clamp and clevis to clamp onto shores and maybe on a raker system. And then it can be put in line in the shores, as you see in the other two pictures. But what it does, it's the most advanced, sorry, it's the most advanced uh, monitoring system out there. It actually uses Bluetooth capability on this. One, one device can actually monitor load, vibration, and incline. Also, the parameters can be set on the Rescue Guardian for what you need. You can, perhaps if you only want to monitor load, it can be set to only monitor load, or only vibration, or only incline. Or you can do the option of monitoring load and vibration, load and incline, vibration and incline, load and incline. It doesn't make a difference. You can set up the parameters to do whatever you need with this. It will remotely monitor 10 rescue guardians off of uh, one device. Uh, the devices that, that, that you can use are your iOS, uh, Apple uh, phones, your smartphones, your iPads. It can also be used off the Android system, the Android phones, uh, the Android pads. It doesn't make a difference. You can connect up to 10 devices on the one system or the one pad or the multiple pads. Also, you can use one load cell if you wanted to in a system. And you can, you, can, you can connect that one load cell to 10 different uh, handheld machines, whether it be your iPad, your iPhone, your Android. You can connect that one to 10 of those. So different people can monitor that uh, Rescue Guardian while it's under load, while it's in the building, while it's under a vehicle, so they can monitor for any load change, angle change, or vibration change. All that can be done. <clears throat> Again, the device is, is uh, wirelessly transmits and changes to your cell phone and tablet through Bluetooth. It's got six high-powered LED lights through each side of the, of the Rescue Guardian that you'll see later in the video. It can stand alone. You can just put it into a base plate and just stand it on the ground if you're in an earthquake zone. Then it can monitor, monitor, sorry. Then it can monitor the vibrations coming through the earth. It'll monitor up to 20,000 pounds with a four to one safety. So going back to, the, as I was explaining with the struts, uh, one to one is 80, it will measure up to 80,000 pounds, one to one. It's got rechargeable batteries in there. Now the, the batteries will last for, for a week, depending on the use of the Rescue Guardian. They can be hot swapped. It's got two batteries in the back. Whereas if you reach out, take one out, put a fresh one in, then take the other one out, then put the fresh one in. And the, the Rescue Guardian does not lose power and it does not lose any data. What the Rescue Guardian has as well, it's got a black box feature in it that collects data when it alarms. Um, what that does for you, is you can actually download that to an Excel sheet uh, for, for debrief uh, for, for later on after everything's done. So you can see what actually happened, whether it be load, incline, or vibration that set the, the alarm off that had it to start recording in the black box. The black box will take up to 125 megs. And once it reaches capacity, the old data will start falling, falling off the, the memory as new data is put on. It's easy to set up and it's easy to deploy. If you take a look at structural collapse, this one is monitoring load. 
but you can also set you can also set it up to monitor your incline and monitor vibration. It measures axial load when in line. It works with uh, both acne threads, transmits to a remote app, a Paratag app, that everything be done on your phone. And as I said earlier, all the alarm parameters can be preset for specific scenarios. This one is incline on a raker system. And what that does, it's in, it, this one it will monitor the same as the other, the, the other one, the previous one. This one is monitoring load. It'll also monitor the incline of the raker and it'll also monitor vibration if you want to set it up for vibration. Again, I, I already spoke about the black, black box feature with this. Next one, these ones are set up for, for vibration, incline. All the vibration setup is, it's set on a, a Hertz parameter. What it does on, on the, 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 the Rescue Guardian is the setting for your vibration, for example, it's got a low, medium, and high setting on the Rescue Guardian that your basic end user can use. Uh, in an earthquake zone, you can attend to set that to low. Uh, medium, you may want to do that with a, with, a, with a vehicle or something like that, something that's going on. On high, high will pick up everything that, that, that's going on in the scene. Uh, if someone's using a hammer, knocking a nail in, then it's going to pick that up. It's going to pick up jackhammers. It's going to pick up vehicles driving by or on the scene, generators on the scene. It's going, to, it's going to pick all that up on a high setting. So you want to take a look at the, capacity, the different capacities of this and the parameters of your vibration with low, medium, and high. Again, the low setting is going to be used for your, your earthquakes and things like that. Now, the other thing this has got on vibration, with a, there's a little toolbox feature there. What that toolbox feature does for you if you've got a geotech on your task force, basically a geotech understands uh, zero to 100 hertz of what it does, they can finely tune the rescue guardian from zero to 100 hertz, depending on the scenario, the discipline, or the scene where you're at. And they can, they can, they can narrow it down to what's going on, to how deep the earthquake is, and things like that. So with that, when using the multiple units, they can monitor vibration in different parts of the collapse, and they can be set up. You can name these. If I've got 10 units in a building, I can name them 1 to 10, or I can name them uh, west wall lower, uh, basement west wall, so I know which one of, one of the guardians are doing what, and that will come up on your cell phone where you can change the names of the different guardians. So you can actually monitor different parts of the building that these, these guardians are actually trying to protect the rescuers in. All the alarm parameters, as I said earlier, can be preset for specific scenarios. You can come in and preset, preset this before you get there. Preset the parameter to, I want this, if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm monitoring load in a collapse uh, building, I want to monitor this, I'm going to set set the rescue guardian to alarm a thousand pound over a parameter that I'm going to set. So if I set this in place and I put on the rescue guardian, rescue guardian is going to come to zero. I've already set my parameter a thousand pound. What that does, if my load goes over a thousand pound, that rescue guardian is going to alarm. Again, with incline, the same thing. I'll set it up. It's all in place. I'll hit the power buttons to go on. Rescue Guardians are going to come on, and I'm going to set my parameter for, say, 10 degrees. So now my Rescue Guardian is going to alarm if it goes 10 degrees one way or 10 degrees the other way. In or out, it's going to alarm on that 10 degrees. And so on and so forth for the vibration. So that's it for the equipment that comes with your, your SMTs.
Uh, I'm going to put this over now to, to Randy Jernigan from Spec Rescue. He's going to explain more about the actual applications. And you're going to see some videos of how the applications and, and the, the equipment get set up through different scenarios and different disciplines that we use in structural collapse using an SMT. Again, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager for Paratech. Thank you for, for attending this webinar, and I'll see you in a little bit. Hi, my name is Randy Jernigan. I'm with Spec Rescue International. Today, uh, we're doing a webinar with Paratech that's going to discuss the pneumatics, or mechanical shores, and integrating that to how we're going to come back and do our wood shoring. Uh, just a little bit of background. I'm a SES instructor, lead instructor. I'm also a lieutenant on a heavy rescue in Newport News. So we're going to start today with why we shore. So something's going on. Uh, whether that be man-made, disaster, uh, old age of the building, something's gone wrong to this building to where we now have a collapse that we have to mitigate. Uh, old old adage of if there's no life at threat, uh, we don't do shoring. That's, that's incorrect. Uh, we do shoring for investigations. We do uh, shoring for OSHA have to come in and do their, their part after a, a fatality or a, a workplace event. Uh, we also should consider shoring for property conservation as well. Um, and what we're going to really dive into today is we've got these mechanical and pneumatic shores that our fire chiefs are not going to be okay with us just leaving behind the scene. And some of these shores could be there for days of months um, while investigations are going on. So we really need to uh, put these mechanical shores up, which will allow us the safe area to then uh, come in and build our permanent wood shores around them so that the area is safe while we are uh, in the rest of our uh, mechanical shores back so that we're ready for the next call. So going on to the next slide, uh, everything we do in shoring, no matter whether that be the raker shore, the window shore, whatever shore it is, we're going to operate under the double funnel principle. So we need to collect the load from where it was originating and where it's trying to go now and then disperse that load down through a post or a raker and distribute it, redistribute it back to the sole. Everything's going to go back to gravity. Or everybody, everything results in gravity, so everything eventually is going to come down. So what we're trying to do is, is control that and prevent the gravity from, from doing its part and us use our post or our rake to redistribute that load back through where it would like to be, which is the ground. So uh, whether that gets distrib distributed between a sole plate, a trough box, a whale back system, that's all gonna be dependent on the type of shore you give. Something else we need to have in every one of the shores we build is we need adjustability and positive connections. Those connections um, are gonna be guts, braces, all different types. We need to have that uh, securing uh, feature in there so that we know we're actually controlling the load how we want to. Uh, we also need lateral bracing. So we want these shores to be built so that they're not, they will resist uh, some lateral forces. They're not as strong laterally as they are in compression, obviously, but we want them to uh, not buckle on us. And how we do that is to use lateral bracing. And the last thing is we need to have forgiveness in our shores. So when we say that forgiveness also kind of goes with uh, uh, warning signs. So if, it, if there's a warning of failure, it's going to allow us to see that ahead of time. That's one thing the mechanical shores don't do that well on, that once we put our permanent wood shores in, we will be able to, uh, with wedges or the headers. Uh, those mechanical shores are all metal and they're very, very strong, uh, but they, they don't give us that uh, little bit of forgiveness or that, that warning sign to failure that wood does. So let's start right in regular shores because the sequence that we do, and you'll see here today, we're gonna shore from the outside in. We don't wanna enter the building if the building is leaning out, uh, racked, or it could fall on top of us. So that doesn't always mean you have to rake or shore up, but it does mean that if you are going to enter the side where the building is leaning out, we want we need to shore that before making entry. So rake or shores. Um, in order to use the pneumatic or the mechanical shores, you're going to have to have some special pieces um, to, to make this work. So those special pieces are listed on the PowerPoint there. I'm not going to recite them all to you. Um, and we'll get into them as we go, but, uh, there's a few pieces in there. You don't have an addition to, you can't, uh, build the regular shore. 
Um, key to this is we have to anchor our base plates, whether that be through a uh, whaleback system or driving pickets directly through the plates. Uh, there is a steel angle that goes under the base plate that we can use so that the whaleback system will work. And these systems can be used with a horizontal and diagonal two by six bracing. So you don't have to be in and what we're going to get into in a minute is called the absolute. It can be braced with wood as well. One thing I want to make sure you understand is that no different than as a wood shore, you're going to need to pin these to the wall. Uh, these are going to be even worse for the, the walking up the wall that you, you will see with wood if you don't pin it. But we have this uh, nice slick surface on the back side of those raker rails. The moment you put a little pressurization to it, it's definitely going to walk up that wall. Um, it's definitely best to use in a, to initial, initially shore the building by putting this in. And most people can put one of these systems in after a little bit of training um, in approximately 10 minutes. Uh, putting this system in for 10 minutes is well worth the time it takes you to build your wood shores because you now know you're doing it safely. Uh, we actually get started into the building of each one is use midpoint brace and double X bracing for ragers over 11 foot. And that's uh, not, not the insertion height that we're talking about. We're talking about the raker length itself. So you can see here we have two examples of uh, rakers. The one on the left is built with all uh, pneumatic shoring. And the one on the right is used with wood cross bracing. Uh, so we do have the, the horizontals and the diagonals provided there with uh, wood and basically get a nail pad and you place your wood in the same way you do with the wooden ones. The one on the left, we have uh, some B57s that are replaced. And if you look at the, the top, middle and bottom, those are B57s. Those B57s control tension and um, compression. So you have to screw them in and out. They don't operate the same way a strut does because it's controlling that lateral force for us. By having that in place, now we're holding our raker uh, from buckling left and right, uh, or leaning either direction. We also have the uh, diagonal shores in there, which are also B57s, and they're helping that little load. Uh, pictures of a double raker. The one on the left is a double raker. It's absolutely possible to build, and it's definitely going to save you time when you're coming back in to build your wood one around it. And the one on the right is saying that we have less than an 11 foot raker and it shows you a configuration where you can use all pneumatic shores uh, and not have to use wooden ones too. So if, as long as that raker is under the 11 foot, mark, you can get away with just on a bottom of diagonal brace. So flying raker, uh, the flying raker has been taken, uh, I don't want to say taken out of the FEMA manuals, but we're starting to go away from them with wood. Uh, because of the split sole. By having the split sole in there, you're basically um, eliminating the need for a flying raker. That is not the case when it comes to the pneumatics. So with the pneumatic or the mechanical shore, the flying raker is definitely a temporary shore. And you'll see on our PowerPoint where it says it's still operating at the thousand pounds. That only applies when it's one raker arm itself. So if we have one side of this raker system, that is gonna have a thousand pounds. If we put this system together, as it is in the picture, once it's completely braced, you get the exact same weight rating as if it were a solid sole. So those uh, those numbers are on the breaker rails or they'll be on uh, a further slide in the PowerPoint when we get to it. Uh, so how we're going to put these in place. So these raker shores, if you look at the picture, they have a raker rail. That rail comes in different sizes and it doesn't matter which size you pick. That's basically to be to overcome whatever spool pile you have. Um, one thing we haven't discussed yet is insertion points. So our typical insertion points are going to be uh, eight foot for residential, 10 foot for commercial. And as I said, there's not a guarantee. That's just our typical, um, our typical numbers. The FEMA man manual has allowed us to go two foot below that uh, in states you can still obtain the capture and positive pressure um, controlling the load up to that point. It used to be a foot above and a foot below strictly two feet below. We can use this to our advantage. So by using this to our advantage, if I have, we're going to just do some pretend numbers here and say we're, we're shoring a commercial job that's at the 10 foot uh, insertion point height. If I know that my wood one's going to be at 10 foot, I'm going to come back in and do my uh, pneumatics or mechanicals at eight foot. 
What this allows me to do is allows me to shun the raker length, drop it down. When I put the permanent one, it'll actually be above the pneumatic one. I'm also going to change my angle. So when I bring that angle from, I can do a 45 or a 60. I'm going to build my permanent one at 45 because that's the strongest one we do. I'm going to build these uh, temporary ones at 60. By producing it to 60, it also shortens the raker arm length, which brings it in. So hopefully it's two things. You can use less material. And uh, now I'm changing the angle to be a steeper angle. So all of my materials uh, for the pneumatics will actually end up inside of the permanent raker. So by changing the angle to 60, that, that shortens us up as well. We also know about raker spacing is I can go a maximum of eight foot wide. I had eight foot wide on my permanent one. I'm going to build my temporary or my mechanical raker at six foot. So by coming to that six foot, it lines you up perfect for the B57s which is a brace from five to seven feet. So that six foot falls right into that window. When I put the clamp and clevis on each side, I end up almost right at that six foot mark. Being at that, that range, I don't have to thread the collars out as much. And I'm now allowing both rakers to be built on the outside as my mechanical rakers. So I can have my system almost completely built before I think about taking anything down. So one thing we don't wanna do is pressurize then depressurize, then repressurize this building. So once we get capture on the building, we wanna maintain capture. So we're gonna capture with our pneumatics or mechanicals. Then we're going to put our permanent wood one around it, capture with those, and then we will DC or take down our uh, mechanical shores on the inside. So let's get into how we build this flying raker. So we're just gonna do one arm uh, and you'll just, uh, Fall with me on, you'll do the second one the exact same way. So the first arm, we've got our raker rails. On the side of those raker rails, you'll see holes. With the exception of the very top of the very bottom hole, those are six inches apart. That way, if you joined the two rails together, they would be the foot apart that every other hole is. So if you look down the side of the rail and you look at in between holes, they're gonna be, they're gonna be that one foot apart. So what I do to determine my angle first, okay, is I'm going to take the rail latches. They're pieces that uh, come with the Paratech kit. You'll place that into one of the holes. And let's make that your top hole. So in the top hole, you, then you'll skip two open holes, place the rail latch into the third hole, and that will give you a 45 degree raker. If you skip three holes and place the rail latch into the fourth hole, that will give you your 60 degree. So we're gonna do the 60 degree. So we've skipped three open holes. We've placed our latch into the fourth hole. So now we're set up with our raker rail. So now we have come up with our uh, raker length. So if I have a 10 foot insertion point and I'm going to come down to the eight foot, like we said, we're gonna reduce it. I'm gonna to go to my calculator because this isn't a math class. Uh, so I take my multiplier of 14. I multiply it by my insertion height it is 112 inches. Divide that, so 9.3 would be our rake arm length. The beauty of the mechanical shores is we can get close to that. So if I'm at nine foot or I'm at nine and a half feet, it may change my angle some, but it's not gonna be a deal breaker for us. So I'm gonna pull out of the 6.10 barrel, I'm gonna pull approximately three feet out and I'm gonna put it into my base plate. That base plate is going to be your standard 12 by 12 base plate that's got the D-ring and the carry handle. Make sure the carry handle is facing the building. That way, if you wanted to come back behind these and place that angle that we talked about at the beginning, that piece of angle iron, and put it in there, you could put that in and put an entire wheel back system behind these rakers. So we've got our raker attached. The one piece we're missing now is the B23. If you look closely in the picture on the right, you can see... On the bottom, there's a B23 there, and that is a brace that's two to three feet. That gets put into the bottom latch. The raker goes into the top latch. The B23 goes into the bottom latch. I want to leave that B3 completely collapsed. And once it's completely collapsed, I leave it at a 90 degrees and then connect my raker arm to the B23, and I clamp it down. When I clamp it down in that formula, so I have the B23 out, I have the open holes on the side and I have my raker arm coming out, I should have a right triangle. That right triangle, if you've done it correctly, should be uh, the angle that you're looking for 
for your raker, whether it had was the 60 or the 45. You can see by playing with it, if you go two open holes, you can see how that would push out that raker arm a little bit, which would give you the 45 degree. By coming that one extra open hole, it brings it in a little closer because you've dropped it down one foot, which will give you the 60. So we've built one arm of the, of the raker. We're gonna place that to the building. So somebody's got a stand bag, line it up, plumb level square. We, we place it into the building gently. We don't wanna hit, hit the building in any form or fashion until we have this nice and secured against the building. Goes against the building, then we're going to pin it. I'm not gonna get into pinning it today. There's so many different ways to pin it. It could be uh, drilling through masonry, placing some rebar. It could be wedge anchors. You could be putting a plot backer board on there and screwing it to the studs that are there. <clears throat> if you check your FEMA manual, you'll, you'll see that uh, there's plenty of opportunities for you to figure out how you're gonna secure that to the building but it needs to be secured prior to pressurization. So how we're gonna pressurize is we get our Paratech hammer and we're gonna spin the collar. We're not trying to lift the building or right the building, we're just trying to give it some good uh, stable capture. So give it some uh, mechanical advantage by using the Acme threads with the Paratech hammer to secure it nice and tight. Once that's achieved, excuse me, I did this one step of securing the base plates. So we need to secure the base plates by it being a whaleback system, or as you see in this picture, they've got the 12 by base plates. You can drive pickets directly through there. For soil, it's probably a better idea to place a whaleback system behind it so you can spread your pickets out. Because for soil, you're gonna need four pickets per raker. So in these pictures here, you would see a total of eight, not four. Um, if it's on uh, concrete or asphalt, you can get away with two pickets. Um, just be cautious of the asphalt on a hot July day in Georgia. Uh, the asphalt gets a little spongy. You might want to treat that a little bit more like soil. Uh, so you've done all that. We've been able to pressurize this. We're going to go ahead and set the second one in place, Do the, repeat the same actions, and then now it's going to come time for bracing. If that raker arm's over 11 foot, you are going to have to put three of these uh, horizontals on. If it's under, you can get away with two like we discussed in the other one. Um, but in this particular picture, we've put three in. So if you have three, I like to put the middle one on first. So put the middle brace, thread it out. We're not trying to push these apart. We're just trying to capture them. So once it gets to the point where it's nice and tight, go ahead and clamp them down. And then do the same process with your top and your bottom horizontal. Then you're going to put your, and these are all B57s, mind you. Then you're going to put your bottom part of this K-bracing on. That's also going to be the B57. Place it on the same way you did the horizontal, screw it out, clamp. Come up to the top one and do it the same fashion. The K brace can be a regular K or a backwards K. Either direction will support. It doesn't matter as long as they're going, they're running in opposite directions. Um, so this is going to support the weights that are listed on the chart, or we've got into the PowerPoint uh, a little further up once it's completely braced, which we've done now. Uh, what I'll tell you is the numbers that are on here, um, there is a safety factor built in and they hold significantly, significant more weight than what is listed in those charts. And that data is available upon request, uh, but just know that they're going to be stronger than your permanent wood shore. So Absolute Raker is built the, uh, the exact same way with the exception of how we do the sole and the connections to the Raker rails. Um, we'll get into that, but we won't need to redo the bracing because all of the bracing is done the same way. All right. So in order to do an absolute raker with uh, with the Paratech system, you're going to have to put two raker rails together. By placing these two raker rails together, you can have all different lengths. We've built them up to 20 foot insertion points. Um, but go back to what we discussed earlier, open hole concept. So remember that very bottom one is six inches and then every hole after that is one foot. So I can easily measure my insertion point by just counting holes. So if I know it's half of a foot, I can either go to, let's take that same building, that's gonna be a 10 foot commercial. I'm gonna count eight holes, uh, skipping the bottom hole, or you can count nine holes, however you wish. I, I personally am gonna count, leave the bottom hole open, disregard it, uh, and then eight holes because I'll know that's the eight foot insertion that I'm looking for. It's actually going to be six because I didn't count for that initial six inches, but that works into our favor anyway. So I paste the first rail latch into that eight foot 
uh, that eighth hole or ninth hole, depending on how you're going to count it. Um, and then on the very bottom hole, I'm going to place the other rail latch. The very bottom in this particular uh, absolute raker is going to be a strut because uh, the building is only going to be wanting to push it in compression, not tension at the bottom. Uh, if it falls in, we're not securing anything anyways. So we can get away with a strut on the bottom of that uh, that solid sole absolute raker. So that solid sole and a strut, how we figure that number out is you go to your FEMA manual where it has the chart. Um, it's It's got four columns in that chart. The first column is going to be your insertion height and your 45 degree raker length. 45, uh, 60 degree raker length, and then 60 degree horizontal. If you're doing a 45, the insertion height and the sole length is gonna be identical because it's a right triangle. If you're doing a 60 degree, it is gonna be a little different. Um, and that number is already calculated for you by looking into that manual. So we're at that 10 foot, so we've come down to eight and a half. So we'll use uh, a four just for uh, simplicity in this case. I personally would go with a 60 degree if you're doing it in the real world. That way, again, you have that build the wood one completely around it uh, and then take it down. But for simple numbers, let's go with 45 because we know they're the same. So we're going to have that eight and a half insertion point. So I do my math on the eight and a half raker length. So I'm going to multiply that by 17 because we've chosen to use 45 in this instance. So 8.5 times 17 gives us 144 divided by the 12, gives us a 12 foot raker, raker length. Um, so the raker length is 12 foot, so we're gonna need midpoint bracing and we're gonna need that third horizontal. Um, then our sole is also gonna be eight and a half. So we take a 610 strut, we pull two and a half out of it, and now we've got our sole. So our raker is 12 foot, so we're gonna need the 610 with either a two foot or a four foot extension and pull it out to where your barrel ends up at the 12 foot mark. Don't need to measure, just get close. All right, and then spend your collars. So lay your raker rails down, connect two raker rails together using the union, uh, the raker union or junction, excuse me, the, the raker slice. Place it down, put your raker arm into that top rail latch. On the bottom, if you travel all the way down this raker, you'll see what's called a raker junction. That's one of those special pieces we were talking about at the very beginning. That junction is a swivel cup that will receive the end of the raker, and then it has a big boxy, uh, box-looking structure that's got the word sole written on it. That's where you're going to place your sole, and this allows you to swivel in any direction to create that angle that the top is looking for. Uh, connect your bottom, make sure you spin it and make sure it locks tight because inevitably what happens is we pick this up and it falls apart because it's going to lock the pins. So we're going to put both of those in, uh, lock the collars, get them nice and tight, place our base plate onto the bottom of the raker junction, which will then uh, complete that raker. Uh, slide it into the building just like you did your flying rakers, pin it to the structure, give it the pressurization, um, secure the base plates. Make sure they're tight, then do your pressurization. And now you're good to go. Um, do the, the, the second one the same way you did the first one, and then brace it just like we did the flying. The weights we talked about, um, don't need to get hung up on, but as you can see, the higher you go, the weaker it gets. And mind you, all of this has that four to one safety factor built into it, and it actually holds much, uh, much stronger than our wood ones are designed for anyway. There's 45 and there's 60. You can see the 60 is slightly uh, less in weight than is the 45, but still holds a good amount of weight. We have a raker video for you. Hello, I'm Nigel Leatherby, training manager with Paratech. We're here today to go over the Absolute Raker. Here's the components of the Absolute Raker that we'll put together and put it up in place up against the building. And the reason we put the Absolute Raker up against the building is for egress into the building, it's fast, goes in there. The mechanical components just go together super easy. Three or four people can put it together, put it up against the wall. Raker go into the building, attached to the floor, attached to the wall. When they go in the building, the wooden team will come behind 
and replace it with wood. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get the two rails. The rails are going to be the standing point. On the rails, we've got a cheat sheet. We're going to build an eight foot raker today. So the cheat sheet, 45 degree. I got a 45 degree table, 60 degree cable, table. Holes down the side of the rail for the latch bases to fit into. Holes in the center of the rail so you can pin it to the wall. Whether you're using uh, lag bolts, rebar, or whatever, you want, whatever you're going to use uh, in an anchor system. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get the two rails. I'm going to take a splice. Splice is just here to join two rails together. Splice goes in, pull the pin, make sure it locks in place. Second one goes in, I pull the pin, and make sure it locks in place. Rails go together super easy. Now we're going to tilt the rail on its side. Then we're going to have two cups or latch bases. One's going to go to your sole, and one's going to go to your insertion. I'm going to put this on the sole. So this is uh, going to go to the base, the bottom hole of the raker. And then we're going to count up eight holes. That's going to give us a seven foot six insertion. What that does, it keeps me within that two foot window below the insertion point I need to be. And we can start building our raker. With an eight foot raker, I'm going to take a look. Eight feet, it's going to give me an 11 to 12 foot raker. With that, we're going to put an extension in the raker cup. Randy's going to put a 610 in to start our raker. Then at the base, if we're going up eight feet, we need to come out eight feet. So we're going to take our 610. 610 is going to come into the sole. Spin the collars out slightly so you can, you can grip onto the thread. Our junction base is going to come on. Make sure it clicks. On the junction base, you'll see there's a rotating cup. A solid piece has got the word sole on there. Solid piece with the word sole goes to your sole strut. Then your raker strut will go into the other piece. Make sure it clicks. Ready for our base. When our 12 inch base goes on, make sure that the silver anchor ring points away from the wall because then when it's up onto the wall, our angle plate will slide in and the notches will, will fit where the holes are in the base. So now this one's ready to go into position. We need a couple more guys in here to lift this into position. Okay, so we're gonna carry the, the raker in. The base of the raker rail is gonna go against the wall. When it's against the wall, the rest is gonna foot, foot the rail. We're gonna put it up into place. Tighten the collars up. Come in with the angle plate. Angle plate is there for your six by six whaler that comes behind the plates. That can be pinned to the, to the ground. The holes gonna be pinned to the wall. Some of the reason why we use an eight foot insertion point. In this particular structure, you got the floor joist set at 10 feet. And with the collapse, it's pushing out a bit. So it gives me within my two feet of distance below my insertion where I can put the, the raker in. And what that does for me as well, by utilizing that whole two feet, when I build my wooden raker around it, my wooden raker will be at the point it needs to be for the insertion without taking the mechanical raker down until it's fully built. 
Now we're going to go and build the second leg. Put the leg on this side, and we're going to cross brace it. That will work. So what we're doing, we're making the legs perpendicular to the wall, make sure they're straight and plumb. So when we put the cross bracing on, it'll be all symmetrical. As I said, this is an absolute system, so it comes with the Paratech braces and the clamp and clevises. We'll bring this in, the center one goes on first. That way it keeps everything together. If we try to put both clamp and clevises on at the same time, it takes a long time and you're, you're fussing around with the ends. Now, when we put this one on, we can judge how much thread comes out of the brace. Then we can set the other ones up the same. So it'll take away from all this screwing out at the raker under the load. Now the bottom brace is actually going to go on the thread of the struts. Because it's an Acme thread, it's a square thread, it's not going to damage the threads. Now this brace is going to be for our bottom diagonal. Now the top brace. Now for the top diagonal. As we assemble the rakers and we put the legs in one at a time, we're going to pin each leg. We put two pickets in each base of the leg, each leg. Drive it in three feet to hold the, the raker in place. Then on the rail, on the wall, we're going to anchor the rail to the wall using lag bolts, uh, rebar, anchors if it's concrete, concrete anchors, going through the holes in the rails. Six by six whale is here where we can go behind the whale with a picket also. Ready for the wooden raker to come on each side of the aluminum raker with a cross brace up against your whale pressurized and tied in. When the raker is tied into the wall on the base, we'll pressurize both raker and sole. So it keeps it tight to the wall. And the rescue guardian is in line with the raker to monitor any movement in this building. The double raker. So we built a double raker. You can see the one on the left has the wood cross bracing, completely acceptable. And then you have the one on the right that's built out of all uh, mechanical shores. Uh, how we're going to do that double raker, it gets, it does get very heavy. This is going to capture the most uh, two-story residentials, or we can get close to the two-story two commercial out of this. Um, but it requires a lot of equipment, and you're going to need multiple people to uh, multiple crews to help set this in place. Basically treat this as two separate rakers that you're putting together as one. Go ahead and do the exact same math you did for uh, any other raker. So you'll take your top floor measurement, you'll build your long arm of the raker on that one. The one difference you have here is you need to configure uh, for both floors with our attachments because we have to be able to, if you look into See if I can get my cursor into this section here. That needs to now be a brace. It can't be the strut that is in the bottom fashion um, because we're preventing deflection here because our raker is a little too long. So that needs to be a brace. And how we do that is you measure just like you did for the sole and the solid sole, whatever that measurement is, you're going to take from, uh, from here. Okay, so treat this distance in between the top of one raker to the top of the next raker as an independent system and take this as your horizontal. So if this is that 10 feet, this is going to be whatever 10 foot 60 degree horizontal is going to be. All right, your chart will tell you, make this piece which has a brace in it and can also take a uh, an extension if need, make that connection uh the correct distance that way your raker is the correct angle you're looking for after you get that set then you'll go ahead and have your bottom one in there's one other special piece that's right here that's called a rail junction that rail junction will connect to the raker rail and then uh also connect the brace and the raker of the bottom raker that rail junction has the same configuration, has a cup and then a boxy structure. That boxy structure right sole, and that's intended for the sole of the upper raker. So then you'll uh, get all of that set up, uh, put the one in, 
Again, this requires multiple hands as they're very heavy. You're probably going to want to get it close to the structure and do like a beam raise on it, raise it up to the left, left or right, depending on which way you're going, slide it into place, secure it all down. Braces, I, I, exact same way you do the other ones. Treat them like two independent rakers and put the bays in and the cross bracing as you need. Um, exactly how we did all the other shores. Hello, I'm Nigel Rutherby, training manager with Paratech. I'm here with Randy Jernigan Jr. from Spec Rescue, and we're going to go over the setup and components for the double raker. This is going to be an absolute double raker where we need to capture two floors, not one. So the first insertion is going to be around about eight, nine feet, and the second insertion is going to be up around about 17 to 18 feet. Reason we got those insertions, if you take a look at uh, commercial building, first floors are 10 foot, second floors are 20 feet. So I'm gonna be within that two foot distance below the floor for the insertion point for the two rakers. First off, what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at the raker rails. As you see, we, we need a lot more equipment than we do with uh, a regular standard raker. Uh, we need to add a lot more rails, a lot more struts, a lot more braces. We're going to start off with the raker rails. Raker rails, again, it's going to give me a cheat sheet. We're going to build a double raker as a 60, 60 degree raker. So I'm going to use my bottom table for what I need to do. My 10 foot insertion point is going to give me about an 11 foot raker. My 18 foot is going to give me around about a 16 foot raker. We're going to start off with the raker rails. We're going to build this, we're going to put three rails together to give us our height we need for our two insertion points. So with our three rails together, we're going to take a look at the sole strut and the two insertion struts. So my sole strut is going to go in my bottom hole if I haven't got any debris against the wall. That's going to be my insertion for my outer raker. For my inner raker, I'm going to need my rail junction. That's going to come up to Six, seven, eight. We're going to set up our outer raker, then our inner raker. Now my 610 strut's going to go in. Then we're going to come in and build our inside raker. When using this rail junction for my double raker, the one with the word sole goes to my lower raker. Because that way everything's in line. This then will come across so a brace can hit the outer raker. I'm going to have a junction on my inner raker. To join the outer raker to the inner raker, we're going to put a two foot extension with our smaller B23 brace. With our two legs set, we're ready to carry the double raker into place. With the double rag raker leg in place, now's the time we're going to pin. We need to put two pickets in the bases for the small raker, inside raker. Then we're gonna put two pickets in the base for the outside raker to hold it in place. In that time, the rails are gonna be attached to the wall with either lag bolts, uh, concrete anchors, or whatever you've got to anchor that to the, to the wall with your rebar, things like that. When the pickets are in place and the wall anchors are in place, we need to pressurize the system. Again, we don't want to pressurize it too much because of the wall. It's up here for a reason, and that's because the wall is compromised. So we can come in with the Paratec hammer, come up to the collar, and pressurize the collar. When we pressurize the collar, when it's all in place, it tightens that raker into the wall. We can do both outside and inside rakers, as well as the sole. By doing that, it pressurizes every part of this raker to the wall. Now we build the second one, put the second one alongside, and we'll break the way.
the Rescue Guardian is not only measuring load coming down from the raker, but it's also measuring the angle of the raker itself. You can set the different parameters you need for weight and angle. And if it goes over those parameters, then it's going to alarm and it'll show up on the screen and on a portable device, whether it be a cell phone, iPad, anything of that nature. But what it also will do, it'll record when it alarms into a black box feature. The black box feature's in there. It'll record the time, the date, what it did, how it did it. And for that, you can read back and you can also print that out on an Excel file for if you want to take a look at the data later and discuss it in a debrief. So it's a pretty cool item. It's got two buttons, depress, turns it on. Two buttons, you depress, turns it off. If you turn the Rescue Guardian sideways, the actual screen will rotate. So the screen's always readable. It'll beep now, because I just turned it back on. It set itself, and it's ready to go. If I want it warm from the device itself, I can just press the red button, hold it down for about five seconds, then the actual Rescue Guardian will arm. I can also arm it and disarm it from a portable device, whether it be your cell phone, Android, iOS, or iPad. To disarm, I can press the red button again for a few seconds, then the unit will disarm, and you can, you can either take down or reprogram it for what you need for different parameters. All the parameters have got to be downloaded and set up through the Paratech uh, Rescue Guardian app that this is attached to. It's a Bluetooth technology. It's got a good line of sight functionality and it's good for all purpose. This one is in line with the strut. We, can, we have got adapters there where we can actually put it onto the strut. We can put it onto the braces. There's a magnet setting on there. We can put it onto a, a, a metal building. We can actually attach it to glass and to a one inch pipe. So it's got multi-function and that's our rescue guardian. Moving on to, so now we've secured the outside of the building and we can push into performing a window or a door shore. Again, don't feel like you have to always do these, but if it is necessary for you to complete those, we're gonna give you some, some ways of obtaining uh, a window door, window door shore. Um, the book shows uh, the header and soles and then has two struts on each side. I'm gonna give you today a little bit of uh, difference of how I would do a window or door shore, knowing that the permanent team is gonna come behind me. Because the ultimate goal is to be pushing into the building um, as best you can and as fast as you can while, be, while maintaining safety. So we're, what we're gonna do is basically what a, what a T-spot looks like. The only thing I'm gonna cut is gonna be my header and sole. So I take my header and sole lengths, I'll pressurize those, uh, top left, bottom right, or top right, bottom left, whatever that needs to be. So the header and sole is going to be an inch and a half minus whatever the distance is. Once we get our header and soles in and pressurized, I'm then going to come in with a single strut. I place that single strut directly in the middle. I apologize for the picture. When we, uh, we did this one in Chicago, it was uh, very chilly out, and it appears our, our eyeballs were a little off. Um, don't get that confused as we want to be directly under the load um, in the center of this because we want uh, full capture on this. We want to lean it one way or another. Once I place the header and soles in, I'm going to then come in and put a U-channel at the top, place my strut, put the collar down to the bottom, which is going to go to a fixed base. Once I connect those, then I'm going to uh, nail with 16-penny uh, nails most of the way in and then fold it over. Don't drive it all the way in because things can happen to where that nail hole will, that nail can then be pulled through that hole because it's um, just the right size. So go ahead and bend it over to secure it in place just like you do your trench shoring. Once that's in place, then we'll provide our uh, mechanical capture using the Acme thread, spin the collar with the Paratech collar, and that'll give us the capture we're looking for. What this does, this allows me to come in on either side of that um, Paratech raker and put my permanent wood bracing in. So with the Paratech raker in, securing everything in a matter of a minute or so, then I can take my measurement uh, for my, my posts, subtract my inch and a half off of that number, 
go ahead and pressurize and then complete my wood shore how I do uh, normal wood shoring. Uh, but for this, you can see by placing that single strut in there, it gives me time to come back in to do the permanent wood shore. Now I can have crews inside working on the next shore while we have uh, the second crew coming in to build the wood one around this. My name is Randy Jernigan. I'm here with Spec Rescue along with Paratech, and we're going to go over a window door shore today. If you look at the door we have here, this door is racked along with we have compromise to the header. So what we're trying to do today is capture that so that we know the load is going to be secured by what we're capturing so we can make entrance into this building safely. The components we're going to need for a window door shore are going to be a strut, extension we're going to have the 4x4 u-channel base we're also going to have the rigid base along with two paratech hammers we have a header and sole the, typically these headers and soles are cut an inch and a half short so that we can put wedges on e either side to pressurize the load on the walls and we're going to go ahead and get started the sole we've gone ahead and placed into the door frame with the header I'm going to take the U-channel and I'm going to place it directly in the center of this header. You'll see the U-channel on either side, there's, na there's nail holes. We're going to go ahead and place nails in those holes, bend them over so that it's controlled. It won't fall out as we go to place it in. Now we've bent those nails over, that controls that U-channel, prevents it from falling out on us unexpectedly. I'm now going to take the Paratech strut with an extension. The more barrel we still have inside there is going to be better for the strength. So I take a small extension, I'm going to slide it into the header, locks it into place. After that, we've got our six by six rigid base set up. I'm gonna take our header and sole, make the attachment. Center it up over the load. We'll raise it into place, spin the collar. Now we have our strut capturing the header. At this point, we want to step back and make sure this strut is lined up perf perfectly straight up and down. Any type of movement off center kind of promotes shift in that load. What we're going to do is you notice we have a void here in the top of our header. That needs to be backfilled so that pressurization is done evenly across the entire spot. How we do that? Two wedges. So now we've captured that void. We've got tight here. That captures the load. Last thing we have to do is pressurize the strut. We're just gonna give a little a minimum pressure just so it doesn't fall out. We spin the collar, it's nice and tight. If you look in the USAR manual, this is a little different variation. So this is more of a T-spot method of how we do shoring. What this enables us to do is now come back in behind us, place the permanent wood strut, take this down, and go ahead and proceed inside the building to make this work. Moving to the vertical shore, so we've secured the outside with the raker. Now we've done the door or, or window, so we have a good entrance or egress point. And now we're moving to our vertical shores. What I'll tell you about the vertical shores is we've come a long way uh, in the pneumatics uh, or mechanical shores. We can build anything from the spot shore all the way to the lace post that you see on the right. Um, you start to get a little counterintuitive when you get to that lace post on the far right as it requires a lot of equipment and eats up a, uh, a lot of time as well. But they, we do have uh, a system that we're gonna recommend to you to place in place while you're building that permanent lace, lace post. But we'll get to that as we move on. Uh, so we start with the spot that shore is gonna be, the weight rating is gonna be whatever the length of that, uh, that strut's rated for. Mind you, when you put this in place, uh, you're controlling very little load as you're only in that six by six area that you're capturing. So it may be perfectly acceptable if you have a beam that you're attaching to and it's holding everything just like it's supposed to. Or if you're on a masonry floor, you may not be holding anything besides that little cone of area around that base plate uh, at the top that's securing the load for you. So just remember what you're trying to do and how you're doing it. Um, and under, you need to fully understand uh, building construction and uh, building shoring before we just make uh, arbitrary decisions. Uh, this is a spot shore. The only thing it does goes in and you uh, can put the collar in either fashion. I recommend putting the collar at the bottom. It allows for ease of placement and pressurization. So we're not, uh, or capture. So we're not over our head trying to spin that collar. Put a fixed base plate on each side and go ahead and make your attachment.
Uh, once we extend it up, then tighten the collars uh, till you obtain capture. And then now we've got our, our spot shored. Um, this is a type one shore, so it has very little, uh, has no lateral support. And it this one gives us no uh, potential warning signs. Moving to the T-spot, so the T-spot's also a type one shore as the only lateral protection it gives us is the nail holes on the side. This is the one shore that's actually rated lower in the mechanical side than it is in wood, and that's strictly because of uh, the left and right or axial loading of that header onto that U-channel. Um, we can give you more data if, you, if needed. How we build this is we're gonna take 36 inch header and soles. We place the U-channel or U-base directly in the middle of that on the top and bottom. We'll go ahead and nail off our U-channels, our bend them over like I discussed earlier uh, to, to hold that U-channel to the uh, four by four. Place your strut in for the appropriate size and then come back in, uh, tighten the collars, pressurize it as you need to be or capture it as need to be. Again, this one offers very little, if not any, um, lateral support. Moving to the T, um, the, the going back real quick, uh, got ahead of myself, that uh, spot shore, there's really going to be not a whole lot, a whole lot of integration into wood with that. Because if you're building a spot shore, there's really, there's really no need for you to come back in and build a permanent wood spot shore, I mean, a T-spot. So if you're going to build that T-spot um, and you want, that's all you need, uh, go ahead and put the spot shore up and then come back in later and put your T-spot in. Hi, my name is Randy Jernigan. We're going to do a spot shore now. So what we've done is we've thrown up a temporary window door shore that's capturing load. This is that variation we talked about in a different module to where we've put it in the center. That way the team can come behind with the more permanent shore of wood built around what we've captured. So what we're gonna to need to do this spot shore is we're gonna need two rigid bases. So we have two six by six rigid base plates. We have a Paratech hammer and we have our struts. The struts will tell you since it's a spot shore, you're gonna go ahead and use the chart that's on the front of this to calculate your weights. For the assembly, all we do is connect the extension. On either side of the extension, we'll put the rigid base plates and we take our Paratech hammer. And what we've done is we've set this up outside, preferably way away from the collapse zone, and now we're gonna make entry into this building that's compromised to start our way in. So we're just inside the doorway of this compromised structure, and you'll notice it has a beam that's carrying all the joists above. So we're going to place our spot shore on that beam so that we capture all of these joists, simulating that the failure's on this front wall, and we need to replace that, that load capture. That's how we do it. We put it directly under the load, we're going to raise it up, we spin the collars, make sure it's nice and tight. One thing we want to do is take a step back, make sure the strut's running straight up and down in either direction, that way we know we're capturing that load directly. We'll then pressurize with our Paratech hammer. We don't want to over pressurize because with this mechanical advantage you can create lift. We're not looking for lift, we're looking for capture. You'll notice I've placed the threaded end towards the bottom for ease of placement. If I didn't do that, I would have to be pressurizing from above. The double T, the double T is starting to, to get into a nice, uh, bigger permanent solution. It's going to start carrying more weights, going to get it started getting into heavier structures. Uh, this is going to be a vertical class two shore as it does have some lateral support built into it. You get that 30. We're also going to use a 36 inch header and sole. The two struts can be placed 18 to four inches apart. Um, what I'll tell you on that is we may fudge that a little bit. So knowing that I'm going to come back in and potentially I could leave this um, this double T in to build a permanent wood double T, especially if I'm going to think about doing something like lacing those two together to replace a broken collar or something like that. Um, we may go ahead and do it the way I'm getting ready to discuss, which is take those base plates, uh, those U-channel bases, and extend them all the way to the ends. Make sure they've got good wood capture. But by placing them all the way in, uh, all the way on the edges, I then can come back in and put my wood post around it. Um, the only thing that gets a little tricky is uh, getting your wedge packs in. 
So you may have to get uh, a little creative with that, uh, but you can place them in the same way. Uh, what I like to do is take the wedge packs, uh, drive it all the way in on the bottom. So I, don't, I have very little top, I ha top motion I have to do because what it ends up being is that pushes into the strut itself. But if you have the correct wedge pack size of 12 inches, you can get it done. The rating on this is going to be the rating on the two struts that you have. So whatever height you're at, take the weight rating off of the one, double it, and that's the weight that you can hold theoretically. Remember, you're still on a 4x4 four four, uh, header and sole, so you will get a uh, crush of that 4x4 four four header and sole well before what the struts will fail at. That is the only warning sign we have on this header, uh, on this shore is that header and sole. Uh, once we start to get to that, we really need to be uh, – considering what we're doing and having to beef it up. They do make six by U bases or channel bases. Those six bys can go in there, which will also give you a greater um, strength rating as well. Moving to the two post vertical. So uh, also a vertical class two shore. R ratings are based on the length of the strut. Uh, the FEMA manual and that's with a six by header and sole. So again, you can use a four by four, uh, header and sole, but you're going to reduce the weight capacities some as um, as the four by can only handle up to that four foot span before it starts to crush for your header and your soles. It's not going to be the post isn't going to be the problem. It's going to be your headers. Uh, how we do this is the same way. So you know you're going to have that six foot um, header and sole because that's our permanent four. Let's say we're building it out of the four by material. So the four by four material, the four by header can only go four foot wide between posts. So we're going to have a six foot header and bolt. We're going to take our U bases, uh, channel bases, and place those towards the end. You can come in a little bit on those now because we've got that extra spacing. Then we'll place our um, fixed bases at the bottom, uh, secure it in, get it tight. You see, we've added a brace in here, which has given us some time because now we're doing a better job with our lateral control by having that brace placed in there. It has that, and it's easier to see, you can see the special connection here. That's that raker junction that we talked about earlier. You, there's a cup on the top, and then it's got that box structure that is the other part of it. You'll connect on each end. Um, once you connect that B57 in there, spin the tube out to where it's nice and tight, lock the collars, and now we're solid. How we integrate this with our two post vertical for wood is, as I told you, see if you notice that we're basically uh, four inches in on each side of that header and sole, what that allows us to do is we've got plenty of uh, spacing in there to place our permanent wood post. So we come in with the permanent wood post, we take our measurements, one thing we will have to move, have to taste and middle out. Don't do it until you're ready to pressurize your post. So get your posts in place, Get your wedges ready, uh, place it perfectly in line, and you're going to place those permanent wood posts at four foot outside to outside. Once they're spaced in there, pressurize with your wedge packs, secure it. Once it's secured, now we can take our pneumatics down uh, around it. You will have to take that brace out, as I said, in order to place the posts in. Some more pictures of the two post vertical. Uh, you can see the bottom, there's a rescue guardian on there, and it's giving you a better look at what the rail junction, the raker junction looks like. Hello, Nigel Leatherby, training manager with Paratech. I'm here with Randy Jernigan Jr. from Spec Rescue. We're here at the, the Illinois Fire Service Institute. Uh, we're going to show you a couple of shorts today, internal shorts for the building collapse. We're going to show you a two-post vertical and a three-post vertical utilizing the equipment we got on the top. We've got some flat bases, some uh, channel bases, struts, and the rescue guardian. We're going to put the rescue guardian in place so it can monitor the load, any load shift that's in that building. First thing we're going to do is We've got our two four by four headers, six foot long. We're gonna attach our channel bases to the, the header. As you see, we've come in about a foot from the end. We're gonna nail them in place. Now they're nailed in place. Now we're gonna set it up for the shores. Means that's our header. I'm gonna put the solid end of the strut into the channel. 
the rescue guardians in line with the strut, put our flat bases on, slide our sole plate inside, approximately where we need it to be. We got our two post vertical in place, capturing several cross members of the floor buff. Super strong, but if we wanted to make it stronger, then we need to cross brace this. There's a few ways we can do this. One, we can come in with our two by six, go ahead of the sole, each side to create the X. Two, we can put our clamp and clevises on you, and put a B57 in between. Three, with pre-construction, if we know we're going to cross brace, we can put our raker junctions on you and put our B57 in between. And the last option, we can come in with our nailing pads, put our nailing pads on the struts, and put a two by six. So here's your two post vertical. It's capturing floor joists. The post, which is the strut, is under one floor joist, which marries four foot apart to the other four joists. I've got a brace, B57 brace in the diagonal. Uh, the rescue guardian is in line with the strut to monitor any movement in this building. So there's your finished two post vertical. Uh, Paratech uh, three post vertical is done the same way. Just, just think about this as being two two posts side by side. What this allows is instead of building two two posts, which will require four struts, we're getting away with a longer span. So by having this span on, you can see the joists that are above us. This is a great shore for light frame construction, even though it holds a ton of weight. What we're not, what we don't really need in this instance, is, it may not be weight, but it may be the distance. So I could, again, build two two posts side by side, but I can take care of that with less material by building a three post. So most trucks are carrying 10 to 12 foot board lengths uh, of four by. If we have one of those, just pull the whole thing out and use that and if we needed to trim off later we could what we don't want to do is, is catch extra joists so we're going to have a 12 inch overhang on each end make sure the end of that 12 inch falls in between your floor joists or ceiling joists because if it doesn't now we're capture, capturing load toward the very end which gives us a, a fulcrum like effect and is uh not what we're we're wanting to do for our shores we're trying to funnel everything into the post we, we don't want to be capturing an extra uh, joint on each side of that. So the three posts, we're going to have a 12 inch overhang um, on each end, just like the two post vertical, put your spacing four foot apart, or in this case, because they're the mechanical struts, they're going to be five foot because we treat those like a six by six. And so we can take five foot spacing. I know you're going to say, but the header's only four by, and that's true, but for the temporary shore, while we're putting it in just to make the area safe, we're going to operate um, with little less safety factor and, and space that out just a bit. Um, and if you are, are really, really anxious about it, then you can put a four by six header turned on end uh, and use it that way. But if, you, if, you're, if you're good with taking the mechanical shore, um, maximizing the spacing, and placing the four by in there to capture the load only for temporary use while you're coming in, building your permanent wood shore around it. And, and I, I mean, it should be done with the shore goes in, the next crew's coming in to start working it as well. So that it should be in rapid fashion. I would not condone letting it sit there forever, but uh, to temporarily make the area safe, I'm going to go ahead and take that five foot spacing on it. Uh, so I have the five foot spacing that's going to push my all my strut the outer edge that now allows me to come in with my four by spacing place uh, for the permanent four by four shores, place it in there, pressurize identically to what we did with the two post, and then uh, start taking down the uh, mechanical shores that you see. Uh, this one's going to require two braces if you're using the mechanical. So you'll see we have an A frame here from uh, bottom left to the top middle and then top middle to bottom right. Gives us a nice wide opening at the bottom to make access in and out. Attachment point uh, on the middle strut, just showing you the two clamping clevises. Uh, they can touch, they can not touch. If they're right on top of each other, sometimes it makes tightening that wing nut a little difficult. We 
He's here with the equipment to build the three post vertical. We got the 10 footed head and so. We got the struts and the braces and the bases we need along with the rescue guardian. When we build the three post, we bring the channel bases in a foot from each end and one right in the center. Then we build it in place, slide the, the sole in, bring the post and the header in, the posts up onto the sole, tighten it into place. But if we wanted to make it stronger, then we need to cross brace this. We can put our clamp and clevises on you. I'll put a B57 in between. Use your finished three post vertical. Captures more members of your rafters. It's got a V brace, upside down V, to stop any racking or lateral movement. Longer header and sole to account for that. Uh, the rescue guardian is in line with the strut to monitor any movement in this building. This can also be done with your nailing pads, your two by six wood going from uh, head to sole both ways, creating an X, and your two posts can also be done this way. So there's your finished three post vertical. So uh, box cribbing at the, at the uh, Pentagon. So Virginia Task Force Two, which I'm a member of, I did not go to this as I was not on the team yet, but this is some of the creative shoring they had to do there. They encountered some weight they were not accustomed to uh, carrying in some places because they, they didn't know um, uh, truly how thick those floors were. It became very hard for some of the engineers to actually even determine what the true weight was because uh, it is a bit, the Pentagon, a very top secret building, um, makes some of that stuff difficult. So as you see, what they've done is they've built three box cribs side by side. So they have the two out of six by sixes that are on nine point and the right one, which is at the cantilever, which is holding a, a good amount of the weight. They built a solid box crib stack from uh, floor to ceiling and then encapsulated it with plywood to increase the strength even more. Um, that's an option for us, but now we're going to get into how we uh, are going to mitigate that for temporary use for us in the field, how we can make it quicker. Because stacking all that cribbing, you see, took some time, so they had to be under that live load for a um, for a period of time unprotected. So what we've got now is what is called the uh, high-strength shoring kit. The high-strength shoring kit is a uh, two base plates that have three uh, cups on each end, and are going to have three struts that get attached to those. With that, if it's going to be over 11 feet, you need to have that. There's a special piece in the middle there. That's the midpoint brace. If you look on the uh, picture, you'll see Nigel tightening that clip on the brace in the, right um, in the picture. As you place this in, you're going to want to put the struts all collared down, and you're going to want to put the, the struts into the bottom base plate and then place that collar inside of the struts. If you place the base, the top base plate on, you will not be able to put that collar on for midpoint bracing. So make sure you get that in before the top base plate goes on. Once the top base plate's on and the midpoint's connected, we're gonna attach three air hoses to uh, our, our Paratech uh, airbag setup. With our Paratech airbag setup, it's gonna come back to a VSK controller. That VSK controller bleeds off at 25 PSI which will allow us to not overpressurize this strut as we're not trying to lift with the struts. We're just trying to uh, not have to pick the struts up because it could be 14 feet high and kind of weight that that is. So we're going to use the air to assist us in placement, not actually lift the building. So we're going to place that in um, with the air, turn the air on, get it to where it makes contact, and then we'll pressurize the three collars. And now we've got uh, the weight of three struts at whatever height you're at and that weight ring um, securing the load. Again, no different than the spot shore. You need to be careful on placement because if you look at the building that we have here uh, with the concrete it is, you're only going to be in that four foot of area of circle um, or cone of uh, capture around that strut. So if you're putting it into a beam or a girder, you may be able to hold just like it did any other type of building. But if you're placing it on a slab, just be careful and understand that you're only holding one small area. What this does for us by having this high strength shoring kit in, now you can look on the picture on the left and you can see while fully captured, I'm now building the lace post around it, which gives me the time um, to, to perform that skill 
and it gives me the safety to perform it as well. Hi, I'm Tom Gavin with Paratech. I'm here with Randy Jernigan Jr. from Spec Rescue International. We're at the Illinois Fire Service Institute in Champaign, Illinois. We're at their USAR training site. And what we're going to do today is we're going to wreck the Paratech High Strength Structural Kit showing you how to replace a column. The High Strength Structural Kit is great for replacing a column. So you're going to typically look for somewhere that has a beam or where an existing column was. In this instance, we have three column, four columns here that we're simulating are going to be our uh, capture point that have failed and we're going to bring the column in to replace that failed piece. In this particular instance you have an entire span of ceiling which we would have to capture with a header or a girder um, of some sort. In this instance we're just going to replace the column as if that's a beam. And to do that we could actually place two of the high strength structural kits with six by sixes or so go or a beam going across the top to pick up more of the load. We're also going to incorporate the rescue guardian what we have here today is the Paratech High Strength Structural Kit. I'm going to show you what it consists of. We're going to use it today with these three Paratech 610 gold struts. So a 610 gold strut collapsed to six foot, extends out to 10 foot, and we can put extensions on that all the way up to six foot. Okay, so we're going to use those three struts, and the kit itself comes with these components. So there's two of these large base plates right here. They're designed to pick up a lot of the load and transfer it. And then, we have the other one that's going to go on the opposite end. So one's going to be on the ground, one's going to be up picking up the load. We also have air hoses on here. What we can do with the air hoses is we can hook this up to air and we can use the air to extend it. So we'll hook this up to air, we'll hit one button and all three struts will extend. The air will just push them up, make it easier for us to set it up and lock it up. The key to this system is this piece right here. And this piece is a brace. What we're going to do is we're going to set that brace in the middle of our setup of the three struts. And what that's going to do is that brace will prevent the struts from buckling. So that makes them a lot stronger. So when we pick a strut, we put the strut out, we extend it, the longer it gets, the less it can hold until you put a brace in there. When you put a brace in there, you're taking one long strut and making it two short struts, which are much stronger. So this is a key to the system. We also have a manifold here, an air manifold, and we'll use this to distribute the air from our actual controller into, we're using a controller, we're going to hook it up to this, send the air through here into all three struts simultaneously, make the lift a whole lot easier. So now we're going to have Randy and Nigel come in and they're going to set this high strength structural kit up outside, outside of the collapse zone. Then they're going to bring it in assembled, stand it up. We'll use the air to put it into place and we're going to use it with the rescue guardian in place. We're going to start with the two struts in that are closest to the handle. So they're going to take the top piece, they're going to set that on again, making sure the handle's in the same direction, and they connect it to the two closest struts. We're going to set that brace in the middle of our setup. That makes them a lot stronger. Rescue Guardian in place. So now we're going to have Randy and Nigel bring it in assembled. We'll use the air to put it into place, stand it up, and we're going to use it. We're going to use it with the rescue guardian in place. Incorporated in the system to make it easier to work is our vehicle stabilization controller. And this is designed to be used when we're doing heavy vehicle rescue. We're using gold struts as catch struts, and we want to put air in them to make them go up easier. So this is an ideal situation here to use this device in conjunction with that kit right there, the high strength structural kit. So you basically, you just turn it on and let the air go through. I set the air here at 50 PSI, run the air through the system. As you saw, the struts went up nice and simple. As soon as they lock the collars, we can release the air pressure. Or if we keep the hoses hooked up, after they're ready to take it down, we can actually open this up, let the air out, and bring the column down nice and slowly. Really good device, makes this thing work a whole lot easier. As you can see, our team has erected the high strength structural kit. The kit is now picking up the load next to this column. The USAR team is now building a wooden structure to take the place of this. This is just a temporary shore. Remember to always put the brace in the middle. 
to make the stronger system, you want to put the brace right in the middle. That'll keep the struts from buckling, okay? We've incorporated our load cell right here, and this is very important in a situation like this. I can turn on the Rescue Guardian right now, and that's going to detect any change in load, and we need to know that. If we're going to be working under here, we want to know if the load shifts at all. It'll also detect angle changes in angle. So if this big were to shift a little bit, the angle were to change, it would also pick up vibration. So we can set it to do one, two, or all three of those things. But in a situation like this, and you saw, I probably want to set it up for all three. So as opposed to the site we were looking at earlier, that's just one solid slab of concrete, we can simulate here where this piece that comes across is what a beam may look like or girder. This is where we would put the base plate for our high strength structural kit to make the connection to support the load. Horizontal, you can basically think of a horizontal shore as a vertical shore turned sideways. So with the horizontal shores, how what we're trying to do is we've either pressed down, we've gone interior in the building and we've pressed down the hallway and we have one that's leaning, uh, one part of the hallway that's, that's racked out. And the only way to secure it is to basically create that trench panel effect. So we're going to use the horizontal shore. Or you can do it the same fashion as you've got two structures that are leaning out. One, well, one of the structures is leaning out. We're going to use the good structure to push off that structure to hold the other one. You can see it'd be very difficult to get a raker in there. You're not even going to be able to get a, a, a 60 degree raker in there. So there's no option for that. The only option, other option would be a tack. And in this case, with it being a two story structure, that's not a good option either. So we're going with the horizontal shore. Horizontal shores can be two, they can be three, they can be as many as you need really, um, as long as you have the wood and the, the proper amount of um, struts to take that. With these mechanical struts, again, you're gonna be limited to the header and soles. So again, those the, the spacing for four by for a header is gonna be four foot. If you have a six by, you can go five feet, spacing in between struts. So we've got four by header here. You can see they're spaced on the four foot. Um, however, again, not uh, cheating statistics or numbers, but if you know you're coming in with the permanent wood, wood around it and you're going to be doing it in an expedient fashion, you can place these in at that five foot spacing uh, and then come back in and build your permanent wood ones around it, which makes E of placement uh, a better for you. Go ahead and place the middle one in first and then um, secure an order that you can get to. So middle, bottom, top um, or whatever fashion you need to to be able to secure these in place. Weight rating is gonna be based off of the struts that you have in place as long as you're maintaining uh, the four foot spacing on your header and soles. Now we're going to do the three post horizontal. Here's the equipment we need. We got the 10 foot instead of the six foot wall plates. We got the strut and the bases we need along with the rescue guardian. And when we build the three post, we bring the channel bases in a foot from each end and one right in the center. Then we build it in place and we put it in exactly the same way as we put the two post horizontal in. As you see, we've already pre-nailed the channel bases on the one. And the other channel bases are gonna be nailed onto the other one. Marry them up as close as possible. And we can erect and build our three post horizontal. Come in with the Paratec hammer, come up to the collar and pressurize the collar. When we pressurize the collar, it tightens it into the wall. Well, now I put my rescue guardian on to monitor any movement in this building or vibration. That pushes us onto the daunting slope floor shore. Um, this has always been the teaching structural collapse every year. This has always been the one shore that everybody uh, dreads or is most intimidated by. Until you actually start doing it a bunch you, and you realize that it's nothing more than a lace post and a raker combination, uh, it, it can be very intimidating, uh, but it doesn't need to be. So the more you practice with the wood, the better you'll get. But we're going to make this, uh, knowing that it takes us a, a while to put this in because guaranteed uh, when we need to do this in the real world, there's going to be uh, fog manual all over the place looking at how to do it. It's going to take us some time. 
So we can do this safely with the pneumatic shores that we have uh, on our trailers. And how we do that is, is this picture right here. So again, going back to what we discussed of the, uh, the combination of raker and lace post, you'll see we've com combined some of the, um, the theories in, into these two. There's two different ones here. They're the same, um, but they use different pieces. And if you notice, the difference is going to be the whaler rails on the left and the raker rails on the right. Uh, we don't have the specific numbers for the raker rails yet, but they're coming. Uh, we've been told that as long as it's uh, secured and good tech, you can use them. However, uh, however you use the whaler rails. If you're on soil, you may have to put some wood material under the insertion points of them on each direction to stiffen that area up, but they can be used just like the whaler rails. If you're going to use the whaler, whaler rails, you're going to use, uh, it would be better, you can see here how they have the rail latches. It would be better to use a 45 degree um, angle base or swivel base, uh, fixed base at the bottom, and then place your whaler stops in as they are they are meant for that uh, that particular piece. So you place those in, how we build it. Um, so we're gonna take our raker rail or whaler rails. The spacing is gonna be the three or four foot, however far apart that you're gonna go with your um, slope floor shore. In this particular one, we've gone four foot spacing on it. So, um, and we're perpendicular to the load. You're gonna place those in, measure quickly for your height, and you can get a really close guesstimate before entering that area and have one side of this built so I can slide it into place. So I take my two measurements I have, the three and the four foot on the back or four and five, whatever it may be, have them in so it's one big box, slide the box in, raise it up into place. Once I get it in place, then I'm gonna lock the collars down. Once I lock the collars down, I'm gonna go ahead and put my bracing on. The brace gets on, goes on just like the uh, cross bracing of the Raiders did. And now I need to secure this to the floor because as I pressurize, I still have the ability to push the bottom out or the top out, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to secure both directions. Secure this tight to the floor and then get your good, uh, good capture point. Then you're going to come off of your spacing, um, whatever that may be. We're allowed to go up to the eight-foot spacing. So if you are going to maximize your wood spacing and go eight feet, I would suggest going to uh, six foot again, like we did for the Pertec uh, Raker on my slope floor shore. So space them six foot apart. Again, it works best for your uh, your B57 braces, uh, but it also allows you to build the permanent wood ones around it. So to attach those at the six foot mark, you can see um, depending on the height of the shore, you may have to place a top and bottom brace in uh, here two horizontals, and then one cross brace. If it's uh, if it's under that four foot mark, you're not gonna put both of those in. You can get away with just doing diagonal uh, cross bracing. You see, we've got the B57s completely around it. When I look through an open window, no different than the lace post, I should see an X. That means my braces are running in different directions. And that should be from the side view or from the front view as well. You can also get very creative with these slope floor shores. So we've got a slope floor shore here that's got hydrofusions behind it. Um, that That's going to, if you needed to lift the slab for whatever reason, you could put those hydrofusions behind it, uh, perform your lift and capture at the same time, which is a very nice uh, ability to do if you needed it. Uh, Paratech is, is always looking for the end user to, to give them ideas or examples of how to improve their equipment. So if you have something, it would it would definitely be uh, a good idea to send to Paratech so they can get it tested. We don't want to just do things on our own without having uh, somebody else look at it as it's uh, their equipment. They know it the best, um, but we're, we're typically the fireman or the end users that's always going to take it to its limits. So if we're going to do it, we should uh, send it up to them so they can get it uh, studied and tested and get, get back with the numbers that we can use it under. Hi, my name is Randy Jernigan. I'm here at the Illinois Fire Service Institute with Nigel Leatherby and Paratech. Today we're going to go over building the slope floor shore. 
we're going to start with our raker rails and the rail latches. We take the two uh, rail latches, we'll place them in there four foot apart, which was done by the predetermined holes that are 12 inches apart, which makes it nice and easy for us, again, with no measuring. So we're going to place the 406 strut in now. That's going to be towards our back, because if you look at our collapsed area, it's higher on the back side than the front side. So now we've got it pre-assembled on the outside. All we have to do is take it into the collapsed area, stand it up, match the floor, and then pin it. After we pin it, we'll pressurize. When we get in there, I'll start talking about some advantages of why the mechanical shores will make it a safer, quicker area for you to operate when you're building a more permanent wood one. So you see we've got these at a 90 degree angle to our slope, okay? What that does is it provides straight down coverage for these pneumatic shores. Gives us the most protection when holding up this slab. We have the compound floor here. By having the compound floor in the, in the wood world, that makes it a little bit more challenging for us. Not that it can't be done, but we have to do some adding and subtracting to make that happen. In the pneumatic world, or the mechanical world, there's absolutely no tape measure involved. We bring it in, we slide it in place, lock the pins, pressurize the collars, we're good to go. We've now captured the floor. The one thing I haven't done is I would need to pin this so when I offer pressurization, it doesn't want to slide forward or backwards. So I would pin both rails, top and bottom, because that compound floor, we could lose it in either direction. So now what we're doing, we've got an extension, a 235 extension and a B23. We're going to place it in here with our clamping clevises to provide diagonal support. We've added that B23, the 26 to 36 inches, which allows for tension and compression control. If we have simply a strut in that it'll only control in the compression, we need to capture both tension and compression. So we've added that. Now we'll do the second. All right, so now we've completed the assembly of the second leg of the slope floor shore. Now we'll carry it, set it into place, and begin our cross bracing. So we have the second leg in. You notice we braced it in opposite directions, so when it becomes a total package, all the directions are covered as far as tension and compression is concerned. When we look up to the top, as we discussed earlier, we would need to pin this above and below through these holes. That way we can get true pressurization. If we don't do that, it's gonna slip in either direction. I'm placing these clamp and clevises on here so that when we put our diagonals in, we'll have the total system packaged together. So we won't be using just one side, we'll be using both sides together, similar to a lace post. This shore can go up to eight feet wide. So now we've completed our slope floor shore. We've got bracing in both directions, going opposite from each other, which controls tension and compression in all directions. This allows us to build a more permanent wood shore around on the outside of this, so we stay safe the entire time. I appreciate you listening today. Um, we've gone through all of the shores. We've integrated the wood shores around it. Um, I'm a big proponent of using the mechanical shores to make the area safe and then come back in on the back end with, a, with either the other half of your crew or a second crew and build those permanent shores around it so we can push further into the building using those mechanical shores or just simply getting our stuff back. Um, again, my name is Randy Jernigan. I'm with Spec Rescue. I'm on Virginia Task Force 2. I run a heavy rescue in Newport News. Um, I'm always available for questions and answers, and my contact information should be listed, but you can also contact Spec Rescue for anything you need. We offer plenty of courses for you to take, including all of these building collapse courses, uh, heavy rescue, and you can see the list of the rest of the courses we offer. If you need any of your training needs, you definitely uh, want to go ahead and contact Spec Rescue. Numbers on the next slide. I appreciate it, and you all have a great day. Thank you for watching uh, today's webinar on uh, building collapse using the SMT trailer. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of your questions uh, live that we've answered. Uh, we just run through them a little bit quick. And if you've got any more questions, please don't hesitate to uh, use the chat. So the first question was uh, B Fire 2027. When using extensions, does the weight of the extension take away from the load of the strut? No, it does not. Basically, what's going to happen with that is that the length of your strut is going to determine how much your strut will hold. 
So if you take a look at the label, if you take the length of the strut of a 610 and a two foot extension, which is gonna be eight feet. If you look at your table for an eight foot strut, then that table tells you the capacity that strut will take. Uh, the next one, it's uh, Bomberos, Rodolfo Monroy. How much does the long shows weigh? Can they be carried by one rescuer? Well, the 610 weighs around about 40 pounds, which is 18 kilos. So yes, they can be carried by one rescuer to the, si to the, to the site and erected from there. When they are erected in different uh, disciplines, whether it be rakers, then it takes more than one person to carry it into place. Uh, Troy Russell said, is this positive or negative tension loads? When they're, I think that's to the rescue guardian. When the rescue guardian is in line, basically what happens, it's only in compression. It's not in tension. The rescue guardian will not, not measure tension. If you're referring to the struts, the struts are only in compression. The only thing we make that's in tension and compression are the braces that attach to the shores that you, you've seen in the videos. Uh, Joe Carr, how many cell phones can transmit at one time? Each guardian can go to 10 uh, cell phones, tablets, whatever you got. You can also attach 10 guardians to 10 uh, tablets or cell phones. You can name them. Each guardian, uh, as you put it into the building, uh, west wall, first level, uh, south wall, basement. And so that, that way you can monitor that different guardian on the 10 devices how you need to. Uh, where are we? Okay, we did that one. We did that one. Okay, we did that one. To confirm, only one extension on the gold struts. However, you can have two extensions on the gray up to three feet. That's correct. We get a one, two, three rule, one strut, two extensions, not to go over three feet on the gray struts. And on the gold strut, it's just one extension per strut, no matter what length. Uh, let me look, take a look. Dave Malouf, I think Troy is asking, okay, that we've answered that one. Uh, does the guardian alarm or just the devices connected to it? Everything alarms. If your guardian is connected to one device or 10 devices, those devices will alarm and vibrate. Can you set the rescue guardian for more than one activity? Yes, you can. It's got angle, load, and vibration. You can either set one activity, which is load, or one which is incline or one, which is vibration. You can set up two, which is a combination of either, or you can set up all three to monitor the scene uh, as you see fit. Uh, let me take a look. Okay, Michael, can a two by eight be mounted at the rear of the raker plates to minimize creep? or crush indicator that is that is not recommended. Well, what we tend to do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Randy answer that one. Randy, do you wanna answer that one from Michael? Uh, sure. Uh, so the two by eight, you may would wanna use uh, if you're putting them under a slope floor shore, um, some sort of vertical shore of that to stiffen the raker rail a bit but as far as to put it upon the back of a a raker probably would not be ad advised because you're you're not going to see the crush there your crush going to come from the floor system itself so i would be inclined to to more so put a plywood board on and the plywood backer board would be not necessarily to show me crush but to uh, spread out the load in case i had a badly cracked wall or make it easier for me to pin to a wood structure so that I'd have something to nail to the studs. So I, I would go with more of the uh, plywood backer board over uh, any two by material. Okay, I think the next question you can answer as well, uh, Randy. This is from Terry McLeod. At what point does a normal split sole raker turn into a flying raker? 
when you start sloping at the bottom brace and raising the wall plate above the spoil pile. And that's for the wood system. So this was a, a big contention in uh, the FEMA world. Yes, sir. So it, it's a big contention in the FEMA world because that, and this is part of the reason why the flying raker has um, started going by the wayside. So people made the argument of if you're going to put the two diagonal uh, or horizontals up and for your split soles anyway, you might as well angle them down. So the the rule in the book, if you look at it, as long as you're able to inches of the bottom of your wall board and get within six inches of the trough base with that angle, then you're you're going to call that a uh, a split sole raker. And if you look at the, I drew a, a picture for you here. If you look at this picture, this depicts the wall board coming down. The load is going to be in this direction. So uh, typically, if you look up at if you look at tilt construction, they'll just have a commercial attachment here and run the the pipe shore all the way down. For us, we've extended that wall board down to also interact any of this load so most of our load is going to come down hit the raker and transfer straight down that raker into our trough base which then goes into our whaleback system we will have some load on the side forcing in against that wall board so the goal of the solid sole is any of bottom bracing that we have to also funnel that down to the trough base if we took it and we go straight across in this fashion then we're we're no longer um we're no longer making it all of our energy go straight to the trough. We're pushing it back into the raker. So now we get some uh, potential for the raker to be embraced in the middle and you have loads coming from two different directions, which is what we want to avoid. So we want to channel all of that energy down to the trough so that we're ma maintaining our, uh, our capture all the way to the soil. There's not a exact angle on it, but um, it should be, uh, it should be angled within six inches of the trough. Okay. We got a question from uh, John Castillo. Can you use a uh, U-channel instead of square base plates on the sole in a door or T-spot shore? Absolutely. The only thing you're gonna be cognizant on, John, is what your header and sole is going up against, if there's a slight angle there or not. Uh, if there is, you may want to consider an angle plate or you're going to start using uh, shims or wedges just to make your header uh, 90 degrees to the shore because your channel base and your, your 90 degree base, they don't angle in any way. And that's all you'll be doing is maybe putting pressure on the nails that's holding the plate to the, to the header or the sole. Uh, another one from uh, Joe Carr. What is the item connected after the air bottle? That's uh, on your column. Uh, that is our VSK controller. That controller operates at 25 PSI output. And what that does, it gives us enough, the, uh, enough air to actually raise those three struts up and make soft contact. You can also use this on a, a two or three post vertical that, you, that's, that you've got a six by six on top of there, where it becomes very, very heavy and the balance is not there. It only puts 25 PSI, but it's just for soft placement of the shores going up to whatever you're going up to, whether it be a beam or a, or a ceiling or, a, or the floor above. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Okay. The FEMA soft drawing shows struts angle to the base. Uh, 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 to, it needs to be just like the drawing. Confirm it was preferred with the vertical. Okay, that's that's regarding the the slope floor. I think the wooden slope floor, whether your 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 verticals need to be ninety degrees or angled. I let I let Randy talk about that one. Do you want to talk about that one, Randy? Yes. So the slope floor shore is going to be dependent on how the slab above you is configured. If it's a free floating slab. Uh, in order to maintain control of that slab, it needs to be 90 degrees to the load. So it needs to be uh, straight down, plumb and square, just like our lace post is. Uh, we're, we're controlling. We don't want any angle or deflection because that would promote movement in those directions. If the floor or ceiling is pinned um, by either the top or the bottom, the struts need to be uh, 90 degrees to that slab. 
So not, not the floor 90 degrees as in the free floating floor, but 90 degrees to the slab. So they will be on an angle and they need to be tied back uh, to prevent kick out. Okay, we got a question here from Terry McLeod. The B bracing used for compression and tension resistance still accomplishes that task with extension in place? Yes, it does. It's on the gold struts. You could put one extension in there and it still accomplishes the same thing using a brace. Although we've got the, the pins in place, if your show is taking the load, whether it be rakers or verticals, if it's taking the load, then there should be no pressure on the braces. The braces are only there to keep your shows straight. So, for example, if you're building a raker system and using one of the braces, the objective is just to hold the, the, the show in place, not to deflect it in any way with the brace. Because once you start deflecting off that straight, it's going to start putting pressure on the brace. Uh, we did a test at the factory many moons ago with FEMA, and that was with a raker when, when we first come up with the braces. And that was my question with that, is the lock pins only hold around about 3,500 pounds on shear. And my question was, well, a 3,500 pound on shear, they're going to break. They're going to shear off. Well, the engineer from FEMA said that they don't. As long as you can maintain the straightness of that raker rail, the raker shore, there's not going to be any weight on that uh, lock pin. So we had 58,000 pound of pressure on the raker. And I went up to the to the brace, and I could actually move the brace. It would actually twist in and out. I didn't do it too much because with that pressure, I didn't want it to react. Ah, uh, we got another question here from Chris Jolder. Does the one two three strut rule apply if using a tripod? It does, but it doesn't. The one two the the one two uh, rule applies. One strut, two extensions, but with a tripod, because it's in close quarters at the top and the head is holding it, hold it from deflecting any which way, you, we can use a maximum of two extensions there, but we normally use a maximum of two extensions uh, being two two-foot extensions for the Acme thread struts. With the gold struts, it, it, the same rule applies, one extension per strut, even on the actual uh, tripod. I think that may be it for the questions. No more questions have come through. I'd like to thank Randy Jernigan from Spec Rescue for helping us out with this webinar and doing the webinar today. I'd like to thank uh, the Illinois Fire Service Institute for the use of their, their property and the uh, structural collapse site down in Champaign for us to do our videos in the snow. It was a little bit cold, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, so I'd like to thank you guys for attending this webinar today. I hope you uh, learned something and got something out of the webinar for what you need. And again, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager with Paratech. I'd like to thank everyone that was on there today and hope to see you at the next one. Yeah, uh, everything I said, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for learning. Uh, thanks for attending. If you have any questions, my contact info is there. Uh, you can call me or call Spec Rescue or send emails. We'd be glad to answer it. Uh, I know there's a lot of information that was covered, and you may not be able to think of every question I have right now. So if you do have any questions, feel free to email me. I appreciate it. And if you have any, um, any training needs, Spec Rescue is here for you. We'd be glad to do any classes you'd like to do. Thanks, Nigel.